Good morning, everyone. I am I'm Muriel Bowser. I'm the mayor of Washington, D.C. Uh, today, I want to start a joint uh, press conference with the Council of the District of Columbia and Chairman uh, Phil Mendelson uh, is represented here um, to give his briefing um, prior to a council uh, session, which the council plans to hold tomorrow. Uh, following that, I will provide uh, the regular update. Uh, I'm joined today by Dr. LaQuandra Nesbitt and Dr. Roger Mitchell. Uh, and today we're going to talk in some detail about uh, the district's cases and deaths and what they uh, tell us um, in, in some detail. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn to Chairman Mendelson for his statement and uh, his question session. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bowser, and uh, good, good morning to everybody. Uh, so this is, we've combined our press conferences for the ease of everybody uh, since it's uh, hard to get around in the city. Um, and uh, so this is the press conference that I give before a legislative meeting in tomorrow, May 5th, will be another legislative meeting. It's a regular legislative meeting for the council. Uh, and I believe it's the 29th legislative meeting of council period 23. The agenda, as with uh, recent agendas uh, since, uh, since the middle of March, is fa fairly short. Uh, and I apologize, I don't think I brought copies for anybody, and um, I'll do better next time. Uh, we have a number of contracts that are before the council for approval for, and I don't think there's any controversy regarding that. Um, not included in that count of four are two local rent supplement program contracts, LRSP, which relate to affordable housing. Councilmember Robert White had noticed a disapproval resolution regarding a contract with Sagitech, and I spoke with him this morning. He'll be withdrawing that resolution, that disapproval resolution. Uh, when we circulated the agenda on Friday, there were seven emergency measures. I'll take that back. There were nine emergency measures. Uh, several of them have been combined into one emergency, which is the Coronavirus Omnibus em Emergency Amendment Act, uh, which is another um, omnibus emergency bill that the council will be considering tomorrow, as we've done at our previous meetings beginning on March 17th, that include a number of um, provisions. So the 8th and O disposition extension is being merged into that, and the ballot access emergency legislation has been merged into that. Uh, so the uh, only other emergencies, I believe, are a foreclosure moratorium introduced by Councilmember Nadeau, an eviction uh, prohibition bill introduced by Councilmember Trayon White, and approval of a collective bargaining agreement with the University of the District of Columbia you, between UDC and um, the University of the District of Columbia Faculty Association and the National Educational, National Educational Association. And then there are two revenue bonds that are, are emergencies that are going to be approved. With regard to the emergency, the broad emergency, which is our fourth dealing with the uh, pandemic, the virus, and the, um, the uh, public health emergency, probably the most uh, uh, noteworthy items or something like 32 sections to the bill as a proposal for business applying to or pertaining to business interruption insurance, where a business has an insurance policy that includes business interruption, this legislation would say that that business interruption includes uh, where a business has been closed because of uh, mayoral order related to the public health emergency. There also is in this legislation a proposed 15% cap on commissions that third-party delivery services may charge, um, which they charge to restaurants. Well, restaurants are trying to eke out some income and are finding that uh, where a third-party delivery is involved, that uh, all of the restaurant's profit is being eaten up by the um, commission. So this would cap the commission at 15%, similar to legislation adopted in Seattle and San Francisco I'm told that New York City is considering similar legislation with a 10% cap. Uh, there are also a couple of provisions in the bill uh, requiring payment plans related to utilities 
And then I'd mentioned that uh, Councilmember Allen had noticed an emergency regarding uh, elections and in particular ballot access, and that's been merged into this bill. For ANC commissioners, the proposal is that there would be no petition signatures required. Currently, it's 25. For at-large candidates, this would be for the fall ballot or for fall election, that the number would be reduced from 3,000 to 250. And I believe there's no change with regard to the requirement for initiatives because the requirement is established in the Home Rule Act, which we cannot amend by simple emergency legislation. Let me say a little bit more about this. The election law requires the candidates to get on the ballot, have to obtain signatures on petitions, and it depends, the number of signatures depends upon the office, more for a citywide candidate than for, let's say, ANCs. Right now, the requirement is 25 for ANCs, and the uh, emergency would get rid of that requirement entirely for this election only. And it's because, if you think about it, the petition collection process is one that's very uh, personal. Um, a petition circulator has to confront a citizen. When I say confront, I don't mean that in a hostile way. You can sort of get right up into within six feet and ask for their signature and exchange a pen and a, ball a, a petition a clipboard. And um, that's not so easy to envision right now with social distancing. So because of that, uh, the legislation proposes changes. And then there's a provision uh, that would allow notarizations uh, virtually. That is, it doesn't have the notarization does not have to be in person. There are quite a number of other provisions in this bill. As I said, there are 32 sections, but I think those are the uh, ones that probably are getting the most attention. Uh, many of the provisions are quite uh, technical. They're clarifications. Um, for instance, the corporate filing extension, which we adopted on March 17th, I believe the language said that um, the, um, there would be no penalty for um, the fees, or no, that the fees would be waived during the uh, extension, uh, but we didn't mean for uh, late fees. It's a clarification. Uh, so that, that's a brief description of that bill. I think the way we have this um, press conference set up, I'll take questions regarding the legislative meeting, and then the mayor will um, proceed with her presentation. So are there any questions concerning the legislative meeting? Yes, Sophie. Are you considering uh, doing virtual petition petition signing at all? Or no, it has been considered. Uh, but uh, the access to techno technology to enable that does not exist in the district. Uh, and so for the petition period that will start this summer, uh, we would not be ready, and that's why it's it was considered, but not. Um, it's not going to be used. Yes. And then, for you mentioned at the beginning that you're limiting your agenda to fewer essential matters. It was in the uh, briefing for the meeting. How long will you be limiting uh, your meetings to just essential matters? Is that for the extension of the public health emergency? Uh, well, we're slowly coming out of um, the um, complete minimization, if I can put it that way. Uh, so there are quite a number of measures, uh, more than we're at the last meeting or the last couple of meetings. Um, I don't have a hard, a hard line on when we go back to normal, except that uh, it is difficult to have markups and hearings virtually, and that is going to impede the flow of business. I neglected to mention that uh, we've been working out the budget process the mayor is going to submit the budget for fiscal year 2021 next week, May 12th. And uh, she also at that time will be submitting a supplemental, which is what we call the revision to the current year budget. The council in last Friday's register published notice of our hearing schedule. Uh, because of the need for security with regard to uh, remote or virtual hearings, uh, we're limiting council committee hearings to three hours, although some committees are combining the three hours, so it'll be a six-hour hearing, and between two and four hearings per committee. So there will be um, a substantially streamlined public hearing process. Uh, we are emphasizing that uh, comments 
can still be submitted in writing. And we also have given every committee the ability for individuals to call a phone number and leave a three, up to three minute message that will be transcribed. So it's a way of orally testifying that will be transcribed into writing um, for each of the committees. And in that way, we'll be able to uh, hear public input. There also will be a committee of the whole hearing two days on May 19th and 20th, beginning in the afternoon of May 19th and continuing, I think, till 6 p.m. on May 20th. So we don't have that three hour restriction where uh, members of the public can testify on any aspect of the budget. But because the hearings are virtual, uh, that means that individuals will have to register and then they will be given a link and uh, then there will be careful controls, I know, with the Committee of the Whole hearings uh, on people being, if you know anything about the um, online platform technologies, being led into the waiting room and then led into the hearing itself to testify. Um, those procedures make it difficult and that's why our business is still limited, but I do expect that um, over the next month we'll see a continued loosening in um, our processes. So the reason for a um, smaller agenda is because of technical challenges or there other, is there other rationale? I would say that's, the, well, it's twofold. It's one, uh, technical concerns, for instance, for the bill tomorrow. Um, it would be very difficult to circulate amendments tomorrow, which is what members like to do typically. So things are moved up, deadlines are moved up to today. That makes it more difficult to transact business. But then also, um, we have not yet gone through a committee markup processes, so committees haven't marked up, so there's no legislation coming out of committees, and that reduces business. Uh, we don't have introductions from the dais because members aren't sitting around the dais. And although we are now tomorrow allowing some ceremonials to be introduced, uh, there can't be ceremonial presentations. So in all those ways, the agenda is still uh, cons constrained compared to the past. So it's because there isn't, for introductions, for example, is it, is it because there isn't an actual dais or? Yes. Oh, it has to be. Because if you think about it, at a meeting, a, a member introduces a bill, circulates it among everybody, and uh, then members are asked if they want to co-sponsor. Uh, members can still file legislation, and uh, legislation is being filed. Is that Fennin? Uh, Chairman, um, can you respond to the contention from delivery companies that capping commission fees would result in higher costs for consumers and reduce earnings for, deli uh, for delivery workers? I don't know that it would increase uh, the cost to consumers unless consumers are being asked to pay for the commission. Uh, the concern here is that restaurants, which are barely surviving because of the shutdown, are struggling with a lifeline that they can sell meals on a carryout or delivery basis. And as I indicated, what we're finding is that the third party delivery services are charging commissions that uh, wipe out any profit that the restaurant would receive from that order. If, it, if an order or sandwich costs 10, um, is on the menu for $10 and I go to the restaurant and I give them $10, then they make $3 profit and I'm completely making up these numbers. If I go online to one of the apps and I order, I still pay $10. I don't know anything other than that, but the restaurant only gets $7, which was its cost. And uh, meanwhile, the third party delivery service gets $3. Well, nothing against the services, but the uh, delivery services are making matters no better and arguably worse for these restaurants when our intent is to try to make it a little bit better for the restaurants. So this has been adopted in other cities. I mentioned San Francisco and Seattle, but I believe there are more than that, and it's being considered by other cities as well. And then, um, if I understand the ballot access uh, provisions of this bill, at-large candidates would only need 250 signatures, but they still have to select them in hard copies. Yes, but, and I left this out, the process would be different. 
So instead of going to the a candidate going to the Board of Elections and getting, if I remember correctly, there are 20 signatures on a page, getting uh, 100 pages, that doesn't work right, 10 pages, um, they instead would be able to go to the board, not go to the board, they would go to the board's website and download the form. Can't do that now, download the form and uh, then sign it and certify it. And uh, I, I know the mayor and I ask if she will uh, sign my petition. I don't go to her house. I tell her to go to the Board of Elections website and she downloads the form and she signs it and certifies that she signed it and mails that in. And not only is that a much more cumbersome process, but it's also gonna be hard on the board. And um, instead of getting 20 sheets, they're gonna be getting uh, possibly 250 sheets or more. And uh, I don't really know whether I trust it if the mayor says she'll sign my petition that she will, but uh, I don't really know whether she did or maybe she did and when she uh, addressed the envelope the stamp fell off and it never got delivered. So it's going to be a much more difficult process. And that's why the number has dropped. Nothing simpler you can do than that because that seems really cumbersome. It is cumbersome. That's why we're dropping the number from 3,000 to 250. The Mayor, do you support all the provisions in um, this emergency bill as drafted or is there any, any changes you would like to say? Um, my agencies have commented on the various proposals and I am grateful that the council has taken the policy lead on a lot of the, the issues that are um, emerging uh, during the pandemic. So we have, we've commented and I think for the most part our comments have been acknowledged. I'll just add to that that uh, there is still discussion between the executive or agencies and the uh, my office uh, to work out the details of some of these provisions. So uh, between, uh, yeah, there will be some changes. But what provisions are most likely to see changes? Uh, I'm not sure I could give you a complete list. I believe there's still some discussions regarding a shared work program clarification section. And uh, I know, I don't know if this involves the executive, but there's still, still some discussions regarding the um, payment plan provisions for utilities. Uh, the business interruption insurance is still being um, worked out. Uh, those are some of the examples. Thank you. Are there any other questions regarding the legislative meeting? And uh, I will still be here if somebody thinks of another question. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. So um, we can move uh, to the next slide to, so I can inform you of um, the cases of where we are. And as I said earlier, our purpose today is to talk in some detail um, about what these, these numbers tell us uh, about the district and uh, any additional recommendations um, that we have. I will be turning to Dr. Nesbitt throughout this uh, to lead uh, the discussion of um, the, the medicine. Uh, so let me uh, just show you that we're now at uh, just over 5,000 cases in the district uh, and 258 Washingtonians have uh, succumbed uh, to this disease. Uh, we are, continue to show you what our cases are over the last week and remind you that one day uh, doesn't create a trend. Um, but we do see, uh, note that in addition to uh, an increase in some days in the number of people that we see testing positive, we also seen an uh, increase in the number of people being tested. Uh, and this is half after very robust outreach over the last week to 10 days, um, uh, including former First Lady, council members, and others uh, highlighting uh, our free testing sites, uh, as well as the expanded eligibility for testing uh, and also symptoms uh, that have um, expanded related to COVID. Uh, calls to our testing hotline in um, that period of time uh, have tripled. So we want to continue to remind people of those free testing sites and also the symptoms that they see. 
Uh, we're, we want you also to be aware uh, that we uh, daily, of course, track the, track the experiences of our hospitals uh, and closely monitor hospital usage. Uh, and here you can see our latest numbers that uh, there are a total of 447 people in the hospital related to COVID. Um, over 300 of them are in ICU uh, units and um, 91 of uh, our residents or people in the hospital are um, on ventilators. Uh, it is important to note um, that with that number of people in the hospital related to COVID and people in the hospital for other things, um, that we are, are at about 78% of our normal hospital capacity uh, today. Uh, and 20% of that usage is related uh, to COVID. Uh, so we continue to thank our hospital providers and all of our medical workers uh, for all of the, the work that they're doing uh, to support uh, these, uh, their patients and our, and our neighbors. Uh, we also continue to know that there is a lot of interest around um, the metrics that we are following as it relates to reopening. Uh, and I just wanna remind everybody uh, of what those metrics are, including seeing um, sustained uh, decrease in our number of cases over 14 days, uh, as well as our hospital capacity uh, being able to operate uh, normally. Uh, and uh, the testing criteria and contact tracing uh, needs that we have to make sure that we can reopen safely. Uh, and they are before you. Uh, we also uh, know that we have um, even more specific data about where we see increased rates, and Dr. Nesbitt and her team um, want to talk more about that today um, so that we are highlighting uh, for all of our residents um, to follow the guidelines so that we can keep Washingtonians safe. Uh, we have been uh, releasing cases by ward uh, for several weeks, uh, and we have also noticed in our uh, data uh, increases of rates of uh, infection in two neighborhoods in particular that we wanna call attention to uh, in 16th Street Heights uh, and Columbia Heights. Um, and Dr. Nesbitt will talk a little bit more about that. Wards two and three continue to have um, the lowest rates of infection uh, in the city. Um, we are seeing, uh, and I'll turn to Dr. Nesbitt in a, in a second, uh, this slide just shows where we are with men and women uh, and the experience with COVID-19 um, with men and women, uh, as well as age groups uh, where there are prevalent numbers of infection. Uh, you see there's not much difference um, between uh, male and female uh, reports. Uh, and you also see that the age group with the most infections are people within the 31 uh, to 40 year um, range. Uh, and on the, the right, you also see infections by race and ethnicity. Uh, and we have talked and we will talk more today about um, how African Americans are being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Uh, and we'll spend some time as well talking about uh, how uh, Latinos are also being disproportionately affected. So I wanna turn to Dr. Nesbitt uh, to, talk, uh, to, to talk about the, the cases that we see. Sure, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. And I uh, want to talk about a little bit more today, uh, focusing on some of the things that we are seeing in age groups, especially as pediatric cases have become increasingly more of interest uh, with some of the uh, cases that are being noticed in uh, young people. Uh, we report on our uh, youth cases in a very broad category, the zero to 18 population. And I, I know that some people are interested if, in terms of what we are seeing across that age uh, distribution. Um, about 3.2% of our cases, as you can see, are happening uh, in uh, zero to 19 year olds. Uh, and about z in the zero to four age group um, is where the fewest number of those cases are happening. We've had about 24 cases happen uh, in infants, uh, so individuals less than one. Um, so that's the smallest group that is impacted out of that zero to 19 age group. And then the numbers increase or 
they're more on the 15 to 19 year age group. Uh, so the five to 14 year olds have, the small, uh, have a small percentage of cases compared to the 15 to 19 year olds. Uh, and the severity of illness, uh, what we're reading in many of the publications that happen uh, nationally, tend to be higher in the zero to four uh, age group and the 15 to 19 age group having more uh, severe illness. Uh, some of the disparities that we see in uh, race and ethnicity are also occurring um, in our pediatric uh, cases. Of the uh, 24 infants who have been diagnosed, um, you could imagine that most of them have been related to household contacts. Um, while we have had 48 pregnant uh, women in the district uh, who have been diagnosed or they have been reported to the district as pregnant women cases, um, we have not had any cases reported to us of a, a postpartum uh, infant uh, being diagnosed in the district. Uh, so these cases are more than likely a household contact is positive and then the infant subsequently uh, becomes positive. Uh, the disparities that we are seeing here is nearly half of the uh, cases of our infants who are positive are occurring in the Hispanic and Latino population. Uh, so that becomes of concern to us as we talked about a bit last week about the risk of household contacts being a significant contributor to our ongoing transmission um, in the district. Uh, the other thing that I want to highlight is that we have talked a lot about the distrib distribution of our cases in terms of percentage, uh, but if we think about it in terms of the uh, rate per, per 100,000 population, uh, the Hispanic Latino uh, population uh, has about 1,200 uh, cases per 100,000 uh, in terms of the um, incidence of cases, so we're not talking uh, mortality here, just the incidence of cases about 1,200 per 100,000, whereas blacks and African or African Americans have 820 cases per 100,000, and whites have 175 cases per 100,000. Uh, so the disparities in the impact to the Hispanic and, La and Latino and African American and black communities are stark uh, in our city and have raised, again, some of the things that we need to be more attentive around in terms of how the uh, wards uh, where many of these residents live may be presenting uh, some opportunities for us to focus interventions uh, in those particular wards uh, in terms of uh, household patterns, um, opportunities for uh, more interventions, opportunities for us to assist with individuals once they are diagnosed being isolated uh, in, the, in the household uh, to reduce the likelihood of ongoing transmission. Uh, so those, again, are the things that we are observing as it relates to um, patterns related to who gets COVID-19 uh, in the District of Columbia. The conversation around uh, mortality and who is risk for uh, succumbing to the District of Columbia uh, presents a slightly different uh, scenario or picture. Um, and as we will continue to highlight, we don't share this information uh, to cause panic or to scare people, uh, but we share this information because we want our families and our residents to be informed on how they can make best choices for themselves and their families. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about the disproportionate impact that this virus has on, li on lives of black residents in the District of Columbia, and you can continue to see that uh, here. Uh, we know that this virus is most dangerous for older residents. As you can see there, the number of lives lost uh, in the district increases by age. Uh, and part of that is a function of what we also know uh, just in, in health and community health is that the risk of underlying conditions tends to increase uh, as individuals age. And so we draw conclusions in terms of the, um, what we call the case fatality rate or the risk of death for COVID-19 tends to increase as a function of age and a function of comorbid uh, conditions. Um, we've talked a lot about these underlying conditions and the, and the uh, particular uh, dangers that they create uh, for African Americans in particular. And if you look at the chart in the bottom right, uh, you can see exactly what we're talking about, uh, where 71% of DC residents, um, I mean, sorry, uh, the chart um, at the top 
right where uh, the racial and ethnic breakdown occurs and 79 percent of our lives lost in the district have occurred in black uh, residents. At the bottom, uh, you'll see where the issue of underlying health conditions becomes of concern, where you can see that 71 percent of D.C. residents who have passed away due to COVID-19 have had a chronic uh, health condition, uh, hypertension in particular, uh, or high blood pressure, and about 50 percent of them have had diabetes. Uh, you will note that this chart uh, doesn't necessarily total to uh, 100 percent because we have had a substantial number of our residents who have lost their lives due to COVID-19 have more than one uh, underlying health condition. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see that when we talk about these underlying medical conditions and the risk um, of complications uh, for severe illness being linked to COVID-19, uh, we're not just talking about high blood pressure and diabetes or uh, lung disease where the infection primarily takes hold, but there are other things. So people who have chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease that causes, di uh, that causes people to need dialysis or even uh, autoimmune disorders such as lupus, we've had residents in our community uh, lose their lives by having those types of chronic health conditions as well. Uh, so anything that um, changes your uh, health status uh, from being in a good state of health. And it's important to know that when um, the, the national studies are done or when we're identifying people who have lost their uh, lives due to COVID-19, and Dr. Mitchell can elaborate on this more uh, in the opening questions that, um, discussion, it's not a matter of whether or not your chronic health condition is under control. Uh, these studies are not making a, di a distinction between that. The medical examiners uh, across the country are not making a distinction between whether or not your health condition is, is under control at the time uh, of death for many of these individuals. Uh, the presence of this health condition alone uh, can make your body less able uh, to be able to withstand uh, this virus if it impacts you. And so we really want uh, people to be able to uh, understand that. We want people to be able to make better decisions about how they are staying home and only going out uh, for essential activities and really being cautious of the high risk population and whether these be members of your own family, whether they be members of your neighbor or just someone who may be uh, with you when you're in the store going out only for those essential activities when you absolutely need to. Uh, so with that, Mayor, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, LaCroncha, but I, I don't think that you're all the way finished. Okay. Here. <laughs> oh, yes. So, um, oh. But, so we're going to talk a little <laughs> bit more about um, seeking care. But I do think it's worth pausing if we could go back to slide eight on uh, what Dr. Nesbitt uh, has focused on about what underlying conditions are. And despite um, the fact that you may be doing everything the doctor ordered to um, control your condition, uh, you need to be mindful that you are more susceptible um, to very complicated situations um, involving COVID-19. So please be aware of that. Um, but also your loved ones need to be aware of that um, because if they are not strictly social distancing, uh, they shouldn't be around you. Uh, and we need, we need to be uh, very clear about that. Um, or they need to be reminding you uh, that you have to stay home too and only go out for those essential activities. Um, so please, please uh, pay close attention um, to what your body's telling you uh, and follow uh, Dr. Nesbitt's recommendations. Um, and the other thing that is very, uh, it's kind of a mixed message, I think, in some ways, because we, we've told everybody uh, to stay home. Um, but that doesn't mean stay home if you need medical care, uh, not related to COVID, um, because we still have the same medical conditions that we had before the pandemic. Uh, and we still have people experiencing those conditions, and they need to stay in touch with their medical um, providers. Uh, so uh, our next uh, focus is going to be on how to continue to take care of your other medical conditions. Dr. Nesbitt. Yes, so we absolutely want people to make sure that they have everything they need to uh, manage their existing health conditions, but also being overall aware of what is going on in their body. Um, we've learned so much about what, uh, how COVID-19 itself presents uh, in individuals and how the disease process 
um, ma manifest itself in different individuals. And so initially when we first started having these conversations, we were very focused on having people uh, pay attention to fever, cough, shortness of breath. Um, we now know uh, that there's a number of other symptoms that individuals may have with COVID-19. And for some individuals, they may only have uh, these atypical or unusual symptoms. Some people may only have headache and muscle pain that's unrelated to exercise. Um, they may only have the loss of taste, and sm uh, taste or smell. Um, and so we really want people to be very mindful to listen to their body and reach out to their healthcare provider uh, if they have any of these symptoms uh, that are on this list and to take them very seriously. Uh, we know it's the springtime. We know that some people uh, may dis be dismissing these as simple allergies, uh, but we really want you to speak with someone uh, to help you make a decision. And if you are a healthcare provider in our community and someone calls on you, uh, for assistance with assessing these symptoms. We want you to have a really low threshold uh, for testing them from COVID-19. And if they are tested and you find that they need to be isolated, really helping to help them understand the, that what isolation means and reaching out to us and the government if they need some assistance with safely isolating so we can help reduce the transmission within their household. We also want to make sure that parents understand uh, that there can be some unique symptoms in children uh, because children and adults may present differently uh, with COVID-19. Uh, while again, the fever, cough, shortness of breath uh, may be the typical symptoms, some children, uh, which are because this is a lower respiratory infection, some children may have the typical upper respiratory symptoms of a cold. Um, or they may complain of sore throat, and we're even noticing that they may have um, what we call GI symptoms that come with having an upset stomach, uh, vomiting and diarrhea may be all that they report. So really be paying attention again to any change in your child's overall uh, state of health, uh, reaching out to their doctor uh, or healthcare provider and getting them the uh, attention that they need to make sure that they stay well uh, and that you can help them manage through um, this diagnosis. Thank you. And we would also like to note uh, that Howard University Hospital is standing up a, another testing site. This one located at 4414 Benning Road Northeast Suite 2400. Uh, we will update our testing map to include this. They will be testing there 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and you can call for an appointment at 202-865-2119. Um, we continue to highlight um, our testing lines. And as I mentioned, we have seen the calls to those lines increase over the last week, um, but we have capacity there. Um, and those numbers are 855-363-0333. Uh, as well as 844-796-2797. So please continue uh, to call, uh, to call um, when you have um, symptoms or you've been exposed or you're a essential worker or including um, a healthcare worker or first responder. Please call for testing. And um, I think that Dr. Nesbitt also wants to focus on um, some other very serious conditions that we want to make sure people aren't ignoring uh, during this pandemic. Yes. Um, lastly, we want to make sure that uh, all of our residents know that our health care system is still open. Uh, we are open to take care of everyone who has an emergency and needs the health care system to be open and available to them. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, our hospitals are at about 78% capacity. Um, we have the ability to provide emergency health services to everyone who needs them. Our 911 system is available to assess people who are in a medical emergency. Our fire and EMS system is available to transport people who are having a medical emergency and our doctors and nurses are still available to take care of people who are having a medical emergency. We wanna make sure that all of our residents understand the signs and symptoms of heart attacks and strokes um, and that we will be prepared to provide care for them. 
uh, during pandemics and during emergencies, uh, in some jurisdictions, in some countries, uh, there can be a situation where residents uh, become unsure of the healthcare system's ability to provide emergency care. Uh, we have the ability to provide emergency care in the district, and we want to make sure that our residents know that. Uh, we're here to take care of patients who have COVID-19, and we're here to take care of patients who have all other health conditions as well. Uh, so make sure that residents are aware of the signs and symptoms of heart attack and stroke and are still activating the 911 system for that. Uh, we've done a great job of training people in our community to respond to these emergencies, and we want to make sure that we keep all of our residents alive and well and are still responding to emergencies. And so with that, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nesbitt. And I think a final note, we want to make sure everybody is aware of dchealthlink.com, dchealthlink.com. So if you've recently lost your job or lost insurance, um, please go to dchealthlink.com um, for information about insurance in the district. So with that, um, we will take questions. Any questions? Yes, Sam. Yes, Mayor. Um, over the weekend, there was a flyby uh, here in D.C., and um, we saw a number of pictures of a lot of people on the mall and some questions about social distancing. I just wondered if you could share your thoughts about that. <clears throat> your question was, should I, can I share my thoughts about people being out on the mall? Yes. Yes. So uh, my thoughts are that we want people to get fresh air and exercise, and we want them to do it close to home. Um, and I think that way they're more assured of uh, knowing that they can stay six feet apart from others. Obviously, I think there was a well-intentioned flyover, a uh, joint flyover from our military forces to honor our first responders. Many people could see it right from their neighborhoods, and many people did. Um, and we would continue to remind people, even if there is um, some event like that, which wasn't um, it didn't have to be in, you didn't have to be in one place to experience it, uh, to remember uh, what we've been talking about today. This virus has not left the district. Um, in fact, where, where we thought we would be in having peak experiences during the month of May, uh, and we need to be mindful that we can only contain the virus if we don't spread it to one another. Uh, so all of our guidance about staying at home, only going out for essential trips uh, is even, uh, it's, it's very important to be mindful of. Yes. Also, uh, for Dr. Nesbitt, I noticed we saw hospital admission figures today. Um, is there any trend there? Is it going up or down? Was it less last month? Is it more? Is there anything there? You can tell us? So over time, uh, we are experiencing what we expected to experience at the beginning of the pandemic response. Um, because of actions taken by responsible healthcare leadership in the district, we saw an overall decrease from our baseline where we operated about 79, 80% of hospital capacity down to about 65% because of the um, elimination of uh, elective procedures, um, et cetera. Now, we expect it to trend upward as the number of cases in our community increased, the number of people experiencing um, the need for hospitalization increased, the number of people uh, in the ICUs increased. We continue to see that upward trend. Going Correct. Yes. Um, Dr. Nesbitt, can you, in the slide about new hospitalizations, there was some, actually I don't know if it was in this presentation, but there was something explaining a new reporting mechanism for hospitals. So can we compare today's numbers to what we saw in the last few weeks on hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and ventilators? And can you explain more what this new reporting mechanism is? I think I just explained the first question. I just answered that. So um, that I'm not sure what you're referring to with a new reporting mechanism. Um, in this sheet that we were given, it says, no facilities have transitioned into reporting through EM resource. The team is examining the comparability of reported data through each of these different reporting mechanisms. So hospitals report to us um, there is an electronic reporting system that we are expecting to be able to pull data from, but it does not change the um, actual number of patients who are admitted to the hospital. Sophie? Yeah. Oh, sorry. 
One of the common questions we've been getting from residents is they're seeing all these re reopening metrics and we're not close to hitting several of these, like the sustained decline in infections or the availability of PPE in, um, at hospitals. So the question from a lot of people is, are we anywhere, should, are we gonna be anywhere close to reopening or should we ex expect to keep this going through uh, summer based on the metrics that PC has put forth? Um, I think that people um, should be uh, careful to jump to conclusions, um, but look at what the metrics are and our daily reporting. And when we um, see that we are um, getting to where we need to be, then we're going to make announcements as soon as possible. Uh, and I, I would also say, and I commented to Dr. Nesbitt, that we actually are our hospital capacity. And if we are successful in keeping transmissions lower, I think our hospitals are doing an incredible job and uh, have, have been uh, below capacity uh, throughout this pandemic. Uh, and if they are able to, to maintain those levels through May, that, that would be incredible. But it's really up to us. It's really up to us. If we're able to keep the incidents low, um, then we can keep those numbers down. So what people ask us or ask you, uh, are we any closer to being uh, able to reopen? A, a, a good question is, are we doing everything we can to limit um, our travel to essential trips uh, and following the guidelines? And I think that's all, that's all gonna be helpful. Now that's not the end of the story, um, as your question also suggests. Uh, in any reopening scenario, um, we would expect some, some level of more infections given increased activity. So being able to be prepared for testing, um, which we're very focused on in PPE, uh, which we actually are seeing, and I think I mentioned the last time, um, domestic and international PPE supply lines opening up. Um, and we're feeling very good about our local stockpile, um, which will support our hospitals uh, and support our government operations. So I, I feel a lot better about those acquisitions than we have in, in many weeks. Yes. Uh, Dr. Nesbitt, we're seeing 100 to a couple hundred cases um, being reported every day. Are you able to share where those cases are being, like how those transmissions are occurring, whether they're in congregate settings or maybe some workplace settings? Are you able to share more information about that? Um, so we do know that we have cases in congregate settings. Um, we also know that in the past couple of weeks that the number, a couple of, the past week I would say, um, the number of cases in congregate settings is decreasing, which is what makes us um, have the conversation with you all today about household transmission being a contributing factor. So is household transmission... Um, like you have, if you have a roommate mm -hmm. or several people in your household and we instruct you to isolate and not share utensils and, and not share a bathroom, and you do it. You don't comply with isolation. And then everyone in your household gets infected. Or as the mayor mentioned, um, you have a, someone in your household who has high risk and you go out every day um, on non-essential activities and you bring that risk back to that person who is trying to comply. Secrets. So can I ask about the 16th Street Heights and the Columbia Heights? Can you tell us why, why you, you know, highlighted these two neighborhoods, what you're seeing there that draws concern? And is house, to kind of follow up on Sophie's, is, is household transmission now what you believe the number one cause of transmission in DC? It is uh, one of the things that we consider to be a um, high area of concern for us. Um, in addition to the congregate settings, but if, as congregate settings, uh, the cases attributed to congregate settings decreases, uh, we cannot attribute all of the sustained number of cases and increases we see uh, to congregate settings, correct, right? So we see these cases in high density corridors um, that are not just, that are high density mixed use corridors uh, where the uh, average number of individuals per household is higher than the city average. Um, we also know that there are some other characteristics of those neighborhoods 
um, where the, pop, the typical occupations in those neighborhoods um, are more related to the essential work that continues to happen. And there are also um, some other metrics that we look at that race, informs race the ethnicity. pardon race or ethnicity correct which is the discussion we had today about the latino and hispanic population um, and then can i ask about long-term care facilities you've given this great graph we appreciate breakdown by hospitals for covid patients you've only released i believe the data on the long-term care facilities once maybe twice is there a reason we can't get that updated chart for the number of patients and positive cases and so deaths we've and we've staff. done we've done incrementally congregate settings it's not i mean we we don't publish all of the data that the health department has i don't think any state is doing that um, but we'd be happy to come back here and do another presentation for, for long-term care facilities which has been a, a hotbed across the country and it is something you have released can you release can you give us an update on that today we can, we can give you a, we can provide you an update on it okay thank you very much and then can i ask us the number <clears throat> the number of cases the number of patients who have recovered that data that you provide every day that number seems to have been stuck at 666 for maybe a week or so and i'm just wondering is that not does that number not change as daily it, as the it other does numbers? it does change um i was told right before we came in here that it hadn't been updated on the website so i'll have to get back to you as to why okay thank you Mayor Bowser, uh, this is a question in terms of behavior. As the weather gets warmer and, and better, and Sam alluded to the National Mall, but in some of our major corridors, uh, you have people who are out and about, and there are gonna be some people who are gonna decide, as, as I said, the weather gets better, that they're gonna have a family or friend outing or a cookout or that sort of thing. My, uh, my question is, is that, again, are you stressing to them the importance of social distancing? And what role will law enforcement play in that? Um, law enforcement um, will continue its current role of um, enforcing the mayor's order, encouraging people um, to social distance. Uh, we will make it clear about residential gatherings. You can't have them. Um, and the, with the, the no more than 10 applies to your home as, as much as it applies uh, anywhere else. Uh, and there are just too many anecdotes across the nation about family gatherings that have literally wiped out a whole family. Um, so inviting your family and friends over may be one of the worst things you can do. Um, so we, we, uh, I have, uh, asked the team to provide some additional guidance on, um, family gatherings or events in homes. Um, but they, uh, vi they, they would violate the, the stay home guidance. Dorothy Brazil on the line. Dorothy? Hi. I'd like to ask a question of Mr. Mendelson regarding the ballot access legislation on the agenda for tomorrow's uh, council hearing. Mr. Mendelson? Uh, yes, Dorothy. Um, I want to make clear that I understand something. Um, is there going to be a separate bill that Mr. Allen is proposing, or are you going to fold it into this omnibus bill on, uh, that you have? It will be folded into the omnibus bill. It, there will not be a separate bill. Okay. Then I have a question about provisions that were in the original Allen bill, since I haven't seen uh, the text of your omnibus bill. Should be um, similar. Is it my understanding that the only major change um, that the legislation does is twofold? One, it uh, reduces the number of required signatures for certain elective offices. And then it makes some changes regarding the circulation of petitions um, electronically. Is that correct? I think that's correct. I say think because you said two. The two that you mentioned are correct. Okay. Um, one of the things that um, 
I'm concerned about is, is that the legislation doesn't make any other changes to candidate qualifications for office, such as having to file a declaration of candidacy, filing with the Office of Campaign Finance, correct? That's my understanding that that's correct. Okay. Um, with regard to um, petitions going back and forth between candidates and the petition circulators for their candidates, um, there's an issue that would arise as regards the degradation of the electronic signatures on those petitions. Has any thought been given to uh, requiring the candidate and or the petition circulator to retain the original copy uh, prior to them being transmitted electronically? So in case if there's a challenge to the signatures, that the original copy of, of signature would be available for review? Uh, I'm looking at the bill. Uh, I do not see that. Your question The reason is, I'm raising this is because, is because as a person who has uh, on numerous occasions reviewed uh, petitions that have been circulated and indeed challenged them, um, every time a, um, a, a petition sheet gets, gets copied or transmitted electronically, I don't care how good the machine is, there is some degradation of that signature. So uh, I guess I'm asking whether or not there's any thought to uh, getting ahead of the curve to make sure um, that the original petitions are retained by somebody, whether or not it's the candidate or the petition circulator, um, so that if there is, in fact, a challenge to those signatures, someone can go to the original uh, petition sheet that was signed as opposed to an electronic copy uh, that has been transmitted to the candidate. I will talk with Councilmember Allen about that, uh, that the original must be retained. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and if, if I could, Mr. Mendelson, I think it, it may um, bear saying that the discussion about ballot access relates to the November election. Uh, it has nothing to do with the primary uh, that's coming up on June the 2nd. Uh, Everybody uh, eligible for the ballot has secured a place on the ballot uh, for the June 2nd primary and similarly for the special election uh, for Ward 2. Uh, and so those that primary will proceed. Uh, we, of course, are encouraging everyone to request a mail-in ballot. Uh, the Board of Elections will be sending, I think actually some people have gotten it, a um, the voter guide that includes the request form that you can submit to the Board of Elections. You may also download the board's app um, and request the mail-in ballot. Um, now, there will also be some opportunities for in-person voting on June the 2nd. Uh, at 20 voting centers, um, and that voting begins at the 20 voting centers on May the 22nd and goes through Election Day on June the 2nd. Um, and so there will be more information out about the getting ballot access that was just discussed for the November uh, general election. Um, and I appreciate the council paying uh, attention to that. Uh, Ashraf? Voter guide that includes the platform that you uh, Hello. Hi. I would just uh, like to ask about the, the numbers. The, uh, the the new infection cases seem to be up and down a little bit, but but topping 200 at one point peaking over 300. I know you're, clear, you're closely tracking these and testing is expanding. So I had a question for Dr. Nesbitt about how, you know, how do you draw that line of, of understanding um, what what are new infections and what is the result of just expanded testing? So there's a, a number of metrics in, that we look at um, to help inform this. Uh, we look at the, as you have highlighted, the total number of tests, but we also look at a test positivity rate. So you can be expanding the, the total number of tests that are happening and have a decrease in the test positivity rate. Um, there was the first time we had an expansion of testing in the middle of April. 
Um, we also saw an increased test positivity rate that went down. Uh, so you can still see that type of variation in your testing. Right, so there's a number of metrics that we look at, not just the overall number of cases. Okay, thank you. Alex, CNN. Alex? Thank you so much for taking my question, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Mayor, or, or Director Chris Rodriguez, either, um, we're trying to put together a timeline uh, in terms of how this all unfolded uh, for the country. And I wanted to ask you when um, your office, when the city got the first warning about what was happening in, happening in China and, and what might be arriving in the United States. Um, and, and if you could describe that warning and, and who it came from in the federal government. Chris. Uh, this is Chris Rodriguez. Thank you for the question, Alex. Um, in terms of the, the time frame for uh, when we started looking at uh, coronavirus or the novel coronavirus as it was known at the time, um, that would have been uh, in December. Uh, and at that time, uh, we had had initial discussions with our FEMA regional office, uh, Region 3, um, which is based out of Philadelphia, um, along with the D.C. Department of Health, and uh, Dr. Nesbitt's team and the Homeland Security and Emergency Management Agency uh, began meeting regularly um, on uh, the novel coronavirus, uh, again, as it was known at the time, in, uh, in late last year. And who did the initial warning come from? Um, in terms of the initial warning, uh, I can't recall who specifically, but our initial discussions with FEMA um, and with uh, the Federal um, uh, um, Health and Human Services Department occurred in, uh, in December of 2019. But we can look back in our records and, uh, and get back to you on that. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, uh, Dr. Mitchell uh, I'm just, just curious. You know, obviously a lot more deaths in the city. Uh, is an autopsy required in each of these cases? Are you having issues with star storage of bodies? I'm just curious to know what the situation is. Um, thank you for the question. We, we do not autopsy all COVID-related deaths. The majority of COVID-related deaths are diagnosed in hospitals, um, and there's a positive uh, test that is performed in the hospitals. So the role of the medical examiner in, in response is for um, uh, body transport or decedent transport storage and uh, supporting families into final disposition uh, so that we can relieve the hospitals of, of having to handle that portion of this uh, response. Um, as it relates to storage capability is indeed we um, have had and been provided the resources to, um, to be prepared for uh, a large uh, casualty count. Um, we hope that it doesn't get there, but we are prepared for uh, a larger casualty count. We normally have the capabilities of uh, handling about 200 um, internally, um, and we now have built the capacity to handle uh, close to 1,000. Uh, we hope that we don't get there and we're not there, um, but that's our, that's our abilities at this time. What about the um, people who die at home? Are you involved in declaring that this person died of COVID if they never actually made contact with a hospital? Yes, so all home-related deaths, all scenes, have to be called into the office of the chief medical examiner regardless of cause and manner. Um, my investigators who uh, receive these phone calls from law enforcement who have responded to the home, ask the pertinent questions surrounding um, any infection or history of COVID-related symptoms, as Dr. Nesbitt has described here. And if indeed there is a suspicion, um, then, uh, then those cases are swabbed within the office of the chief medical examiner and uh, results are provided within um, 48, 24 to 48 hours. Um, so we respond to both the uh, scenes regardless of it. Uh, regardless of whether or not there's a positive confirmed or not. Could I follow up with that, Dr. Mitchell? Um, so uh, two questions. One, the two black refrigerated trailers in front of uh, OCME, are those your mobile, mobile morgues that we saw out there the other day? 
Um, those, uh, those blue uh, trailers are our mobile storage units. Um, and so those are staged in front of our office. So if we have to go and pick up large amounts of individuals, um, so those, those aren't our, our morgues, but they're used more for transport when necessary. And then you said you have a normal capacity for 200. You've built out capacity to 1,000. Can you tell us what your current what you currently have right now, bodies in storage? Uh, yes, um, we have currently uh, 253 bodies in storage, both COVID and non-COVID. You saw the cases today of 258 of the COVID positives to date. Families and funeral homes are are doing a a pretty good job at. Um, responding and picking up their loved one and being able to move to final disposition. So about a hundred and uh, three individuals that are were were COVID positive have been claimed by their loved ones so far. So total, um, we have about 253. And is there any? Are, are you finding that there are some bodies, people that people are not picking up, that you would then be left with the responsibility for? Well, that, that occurs on a regular basis. Well, I, I guess any, any outside the norm, right? Um, not, not as of yet. Uh, not as, as of yet. We're, ma we're communicating with families quite readily. Um, the mayor's charged me with, with speaking to the funeral directors and making sure that their questions are answered. And so we've, we've had a pretty good response from families and funeral homes um, making that uh, final disposition arrangements. We are uh, having conversations a little bit earlier with families just to see what their arrangements would be so that we don't come, a, come against that issue. Thank you. Could I follow up with Dr. Nesbitt just on two questions? One, can you update us on the, the mobile testing that was rolled out last week? I know the, the mobile unit went out to some long-term care facilities, then there were some testing units that were placed in uh, congregate settings. Do you have any data back just on how many tests were conducted or what results came back from that? Um, I don't have any data on that. The Department of Forensic Sciences is um, deploying the mobile unit on a daily basis, uh, including weekends when there is a request for it to go to the skilled nursing facilities, um, as well as working with the, um, as you know, the small devices went to the Department of Corrections, uh, St. Elizabeth's, uh, as well as some of the um, uh, low barrier shelter sites. Uh, and Mary Center and, um, it has theirs and um, they like it. Uh, and um, as well as um, Unity Healthcare as well, um, also received some of the, one of the point of care instruments. And then on the, ho the hospital data that you've, you've provided us, can you tell us how many of the current hospital patients are DC residents versus out of state residents and how many of the deaths, have, have we had deaths in DC hospitals that were out of state residents and can you give us that number? I, I cannot um, for two reasons. It is impractical in my opinion on a daily basis to ask people who are providing health care to very sick people to go around and inquire about the residency of those individuals. Um, what we do is that once we have information on a case, uh, we go through the clinical record and we ascertain um, hospitalization information for DC residents. So on a daily basis, when we're gonna present census information for hospitals, we're not gonna make a, um, a commitment to sorting out where those residents are, where those patients are coming from. Do you know anecdotally just a percentage um, well, of Well, on, on average, uh, hospital, uh, re hospitalizations across the region um, 45 percent of those individuals come from across the region and are not DC residents. How that applies to COVID related care, um, we have yet to ascertain or determine. Thank you. So, the, the, 40, the, the percentage that you gave today is the 420, 47, whatever, you don't really know if they're DC residents or not. We, we know that they all are not because that number on a daily basis outnumbers out the total number of DC residents who have been hospitalized. And this is um, something that Dr. Nesbitt has been talking to you about from the beginning um, when it comes to how we report hospital data um, that people come to DC for our outstanding hospitals pre-pandemic -pan um, and we, we don't know the number of uh, cases related to COVID but 
um, we don't have any reason to think that the non-COVID would be performing any differently during the pandemic response. Uh, we'll take a few more. Yes. Over the weekend, we passed more than 200 homeless residents who've tested positive for coronavirus, and we've been seeing steady, uh, steady increases. Are you confident in the city's current strategy for containing coronavirus among homeless patients, or uh, is it time for DC to take further action, like uh, moving everyone from shelters, not just those who are uh, who are exposed or at high risk? I think, and Director Gellhardt's not here today. He's been working hand in hand um, with the Department uh, of Human Services on our strategies, uh, including um, more testing, including following all of the protocols for for quarantine. And if we think that our experience is showing that we should do other things, um, we'll do those other things. Yes. So um, I do want to reiterate that, you know, as I mentioned before, in the last five days, um, the congregate settings have accounted for 16% of our total caseload, which is down from in mid-April when it was 30%. So that, you know, for context setting, when we're talking about how we're tracking what proportion of the congregate setting cases are attributing to our, contributing to our overall cases, if that gives you any context or indication that what we are doing in the congregate settings, if it is working, um, we, we have some confidence that, it, that those uh, things are starting to pay off. But we, we keep an eye on our strategies to see where we can have improvement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.